Um, you all ready, Brother Bill, with the timer? Okay, shall we kneel for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, like the prophets of old, we ask that you would help us individually to see the vision. Father, we pray like Isaiah, that we would see our Savior high and lifted up in the sanctuary, that our uh, self-righteousness, our Laodicean experience would be humbled in the dust, that we may be having the experience of a live cold touching our lips, that our iniquity might be passed from us. We ask, dear Lord, like Daniel, that our comeliness be turned to corruption. And then we ask, Lord, like Daniel, that you would strengthen us by a touch of your mighty hand. Give us wisdom, give us uh, understanding, allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Father, we pray, dear Lord, mightily that you would pour upon us the early and latter rain. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of James, chapter 3. James, the third chapter, beginning with verse 13. James, chapter 3, beginning with the 13th verse. We able to hear? I don't hear the, uh, the speakers at all. Always. Uh, we're in James chapter 3 for those uh, who are taking notes. James chapter 3, the 13th verse. And when you're there as a congregation, let me hear you say amen. amen. James chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now we've dealt with this particular verse for the last uh, presentations that we've had together. When the Bible asked who was a wise man, we went through scripture and we saw who the wise were. We saw what, who the wise are in understanding. Uh, we saw who the wise are in character, in life. For the Bible says in verse 13 that the wise are to show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And we saw this word conversation is not so much uh, talking as it is manner of life and lifestyle. And so we saw that the wise are not only known by what they understand, but how they live. And these are things that we dealt with in the last presentations together. But now we're looking in verse 14 and onward. The Bible says in verse 14, but if ye have bitter envying, and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and what? Every evil work. So we're going to go in our Bibles and find out what it means, this bitter envying and strife. Now, strife and envy are one of the works of the flesh. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Galatians and the uh, fifth chapter. Galatians chapter 5. And let's begin together in verse 19. Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 19th verse. And we'll read to verse 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, 20, and 21. The Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, strife, or wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not, what? Inherit the kingdom of God. One of the reasons those who have bitter envying and strife in their hearts have no reason to glory is because envy and strife if it's in you you will not inherit the kingdom of God you'll be lost but what I want to really look at now is that envying and strife or specifically strife we want to look at strife just for a moment strife goes along with wrath if you see there in in uh, Galatians 5 and verse 
uh, verse 20. The Bible shows wrath, strife. We're going to show that wrath bringeth forth strife. Wrath bringeth forth strife. So we're going to the Old Testament now, the book of Proverbs, and we're going to see that wrath bringeth forth strife. We're going to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and we're building on James 3 and verse 14, which tells us if we have bitter envyings and strife in our hearts, we are to glory not and lie not against the truth. Why? Why are envy and strife singled out? We're going to see these things in the Bible. So we're in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And let's look in verse 33. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 33. We're talking about strife at this point. The Bible says in verse 33, Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood, so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth what? Strife. So when we see in the Bible strife, we have to understand that individuals first had wrath. Wrath and strife go together. Are we all together this morning? So when there's strife, there's wrath. When there's wrath, there's strife. Who in the Bible are identified as having wrath, strife, and envy? Notice what the scriptures tell us in the book of Job. Notice the book of Job. And we're going to the fifth chapter. Who are the individuals in the Bible that are described as having wrath or strife and envy? The Bible tells us in Job chapter 5, and we'll specifically look at verse 2. Job chapter 5 and verse 2. When James says that we are to glory not and lie not against the truth if there is wrath, strife, and envy, who are these individuals that cannot glory in the truth? Notice what it says, Job chapter 5, and what verse are we going to? Verse 2, the Bible says, For wrath killeth the what? The foolish man, and envy slayeth the what? The silly one. So let's take these two identifying characteristics, the one with wrath or the one with strife. The Bible shows that they are the foolish man. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Matthew. Who is the foolish man? Matthew chapter 7. Notice Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. There are certain class of men that cannot glory in the truth. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, speaking about the foolish man. Let's look together in verse 24. Matthew, the 7th chapter and the 24th verse. Amen when you're with me. The Bible says, men, oh, excuse me, it says, therefore... Therefore, verse 24, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and what? Doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. A few uh, months ago, I had an opportunity to come here uh, in Tennessee. Uh, what was it Oliver Springs for those that were there is that where it was Oliver Springs and we went through Matthew chapter 7 and we saw that this rain this flood this wind is a symbol of the Sunday law and we saw that those who have their house and we saw the house symbolizes the individual life the home and the body of believers the church those who are grounded upon a rock when the Sunday law comes and the rock being the rock of ages Christ and that which we are told in the spirit of prophecy is the rock of ages the truths of 1840 to 44 if we are grounded upon the rock at the Sunday law we will not be moved but then it says this notice what it says in verse 26 and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and what doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. Now remember, the foolish man is destroyed by having wrath, strife. So the Bible says, he's likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The Bible says the foolish man, or the foolish men, are those that hear the words of the Lord and do them not. So with this understanding, jump up just a few verses. Same chapter, and let's just look quickly in verse 21. We're talking about the foolish men. Who are the foolish men? The Bible says these are the ones with wrath and strife. These are the ones that hear the words and do them not. But let's be more specific. Who are the foolish men? The Bible says in verse 21, 
Not everyone that saith unto me, what? Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Down. Testing. We all right? All right. So we're in Matthew chapter 7. In verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Remember, the ones that do the will of the Father are the wise men. But those that do not the will of the Father are the what? Foolish men. So the foolish men here are the ones that are saying, Lord, Lord. Keep this in your mind. The Bible says in verse 22, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the foolish men who do not do the will of the Lord, they're the ones that say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these wonderful things in your name? And Christ responds by saying what? I never knew you. I know you not. Well, take this down now to Matthew 25. And remember, it is the foolish men that come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord. Notice what it says in Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. Very familiar ground for us here. Matthew chapter 25, at least it should be. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. Or in Matthew 25 and verse 1, and remember, the foolish men are the ones that have wrath, the ones that have strife, and these cannot glory in the truth. The Bible says in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the what? The foolish, verse 8, said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins. Now who are these other virgins? Are these the wise virgins? These are the foolish virgins. And what do the foolish virgins say? What does the Bible say in verse 11? After came also the other virgins saying what? Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, verily I say unto you what? I know you not. Who are the ones that say Lord, Lord? The foolish virgins. But this was what was called the foolish man. The foolish man or the foolish virgins. And the Bible identifies one of the characteristics of the foolish virgins is that they have strife and wrath. Strife and wrath. And so they cannot glory in the truth. Now we're going to get a little bit deeper on this strife and wrath, but we want to look now at envy. Because remember, those that have bitter strife and envy cannot glory in the truth. So let's turn our Bibles now to the book of 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Turn your Bible with me to 2 Timothy. And let's deal with envy. Who are those that have envy? We see that the foolish virgins are the ones that have strife, or strife, excuse me, or wrath. The Bible now says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and why don't we just go ahead and begin in verse 1. And we're talking about those who are represented as being silly. These are the ones that have envy. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. When you're there, amen. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. 
For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, what? Silly, silly women, or shall I say, uh, silly virgins, laden with sins, uh, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible identifies these silly women as those that are ever learning and unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible shows that those who have wrath are foolish men, and those that have envy are silly ones. Wrath, we saw, is connected with the foolish virgins. But who are these silly ones, or these silly women, who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? We're going to see it's the symbol of the same thing, foolish virgins, foolish virgins. All right, but let's go in our Bibles a little bit deeper. Your Bible takes us now to the book of Isaiah. Turn your Bible with me to Isaiah. And as you're turning to Isaiah, there is a character in the Bible that is specifically uh, connected with envy. And we're going to Isaiah chapter 11. Who is the one the Bible shows that has envy? And we're showing that this is represented as being silly or the silly one. Here we see these silly virgins, these silly women, ever learning but unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. These silly women. But who in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 11 is connected with having envy? Notice what your Bible says. We're in Isaiah chapter 11 and uh, verse, let's look at verse 13. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 13. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says the what? The envy also of who? Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. Judah shall not vex Ephraim. The Bible shows that Ephraim is connected with envy. And we're going to show you that Ephraim was a silly one. So now turn your Bible with me to the book of Hosea. Ephraim is a silly one. But what makes Ephraim silly? Notice what your Bible says in the book of Hosea. Hosea, we're going to chapter 7. Hosea, the 7th chapter. Hosea chapter 7, and let's begin in verse 8. Hosea chapter 7 and verse 8. Those that have wrath, those that have strife, are represented as foolish men or foolish virgins. For it was the foolish men that said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And God responded by saying, I never knew you. It's the foolish virgins that say, Lord, Lord, open to us. And God responds by saying, I know you not. Same individual. These are those that have wrath and strife. But those that have envy, the Bible says, are silly ones. And Ephraim is connected with those who are silly. We're looking in the book of Hosea chapter 7. And what verse are we beginning at? Verse 8 together. And remember, the silly ones are also these, those individuals that are ever learning but unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here again is a reason why they have no reason to glory in the truth. They're ever learning, but can't quite ever come to an understanding. Therefore, they're not wise because the wise understand. Amen? So notice what it says in Hosea chapter 7. Who does Ephraim represent in the context of our study? The Bible says in Hosea 7 and verse 8, when you're there, amen. amen. Ephraim he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a what? A silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to where? Assyria. The Bible tells us in verse 9, or 8 and 9, that Ephraim is likened unto a cake, not what? Turn. What, do, what happens if you're cooking, ladies? What happens if you, if you put a cake in the oven and you don't, you don't turn it? Does it cook thoroughly? No. It doesn't cook thoroughly. It's uneven. It's half-baked. 
lukewarm. This is the experience, remember Isaiah chapter 6. I'm undone. And what did Isaiah symbolize? Or who did Isaiah symbolize? Laodicea. Those who are not hot, those who are not cold, but those who are lukewarm. And over and over again, when you read about Ephraim, the Bible says he's in this condition, but he knows it not. He's in this condition, but he knows it not. Who are those that have an experience and yet they know it not? The foolish virgins of Laodicea. They're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and yet they know not. And so Ephraim represents a cake not turned. Ephraim represents those who are undone. Ephraim is a symbol of those in Laodicea. Now notice what it continues on to say in verse 9. It says, who has devoured his strength? Strangers have devoured his strength. When the Bible talks about strangers devouring the strength of Ephraim or the strength of those in Laodicea who are lukewarm, undone, half-hearted professors, who are the strangers? Turn your Bible with me now to the book of Ezekiel. We'll go back to the book of Hosea, but turn to Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel, the 31st chapter. We're talking about these strangers. Notice what your Bible says in Ezekiel 31, beginning with verse 10. Ezekiel 31, beginning with verse 10. We're going to see who these strangers are that devour the strength of Ephraim, or the strength of those who are in Laodicea. And then we're going to find out what the strength is that they devour or that they sap from Ephraim. Notice what your Bible says in Ezekiel 31, and we're beginning in the 10th verse. Ezekiel 30, 31, what verse? Verse 10, Bible says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast list, lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up uh, uh, his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of what? The mighty one of the heathen, he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And what? Strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him. The Bible shows that this, these strangers are called the terrible of the nations. So who is the terrible of the nations? The mighty one of the heathen that's represented as strangers. Look at verse, look at chapter 30. Just go back with me one chapter. And we're looking in verse 10. Who is the mighty one of the heathen, the terrible of the nation, the strangers that devour the strength of Ephraim? The Bible says in verse 10, chapter 30 and verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of who? Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon. Who is Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon? He's the king of the what? The king of the north. The Bible says he and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy the land and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. And I will make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of what? Strangers, I the Lord have spoken it. The strangers, the mighty one of the heathen, the terrible of the nations is the king of the north. And who is the king of the north at the end of the world? This is the papacy. So who is it that devours or saps Ephraim's strength? This is the papacy. But what is the strength of Ephraim or the strength of those who are in Laodicea or those who should be uh, represented as uh, God's people, the virgins? All of us are in the church of Laodicea, but some of us are having an experience where we're overcoming being half-baked a cake not turned. We're overcoming the experience and going back to the experience of Philadelphia, the experience of the wise virgins. But in Laodicea, the time period of God's end time church, what is her strength? What is her strength? Turn your Bible with me to Nehemiah. And there's many things that you can do here with when it comes to the strength of God's people. But notice what it says in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah, what chapter are we going to? 
chapter 8 and let's look in verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. And when you're there, amen. We're talking about the strength now that is being devoured. What is the strength of the people of the Lord? The Bible says in verse 10, Then he said unto them, Go your ways, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry for the one. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now what is the joy of the Lord? Well, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 51, 11, it's a scripture song. We should all know this one. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting what? Joy shall be upon their heads. This is the oil of joy, the oil of gladness. And this oil of joy, the oil of gladness is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Christ was one who had the oil of gladness or the oil of joy above his fellows. He was anointed with this oil of gladness. And we know that Christ is anointed with the Holy Ghost. So how is it now that the papal power, the, the mother of harlots, how is it that she saps this strength from the people of God? Well, remember, brethren, there is a certain class in Laodicea that's represented as the harlot, or I should say the adulterous woman. And we saw that this adulterous woman, she has the same characteristics. She does the same things as the harlot woman. She, she forsakes the guide of her youth and forsakes the holy covenant. She has an affinity with those of the other tribes or the dragon beast and the false prophet. And when God's people are connected with Babylon in any way, and I'm not saying she becomes Babylon because remember, we don't want to insult Babylon that way. Because the church always does worse than Babylon. She's an adulterous woman. Remember the harlot, she does her job for money. But the adulterous woman, the Bible says, she scorns higher. She pays for her lovers. She's worse than the harlot. So when we have the people of God connected with Babylon, either by her doctrines that, 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 that meat and that wine, that, that, that filthy meat, there is a, this, in this way, this is how the strength of Zion is being sapped. And it doesn't matter how many of our churches are praying for the Holy Spirit on a certain month, in a certain day, at a certain time. It doesn't matter because as long as there is a connection, there is no way that the strength of the Lord is going to come upon us. The Bible says that Ephraim's strength is sapped. Now turn your Bible with me to the book of Job. Go with me to the book of Job quickly. We're going to the book of Job. Let's go to Job 18. Notice what it says in Job 18. Let's just look at a second witness quickly. Job 18. And when you're in Job chapter 18, let me hear you say amen. Job chapter 18. And it was shown this morning in Job 18, 5 through 9, that this is referring to the wicked that walk in the sparks of their own kindling. And we know this is also a symbol of the foolish virgins of Adventism. But notice what it says. Let's begin in verse 11. Job 18, beginning with verse 11. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says, terror shall make him afraid on every side and shall drive him, on, on, uh, drive him to his feet. His strength shall be hunger bitten and destruction shall be ready at his side. It shall devour the strength of his skin, even the one firstborn of death shall devour his strength. Now, brethren, who is the firstborn of death? Now, in Scripture, death is a symbol of Satan. Satan has the power of death. The devil has the power of death. Death is a result of sin. Satan sinned from the beginning. But who is the firstborn of Satan? Who is the firstborn of death? Well, let's understand the principle of the firstborn before we can answer that question. Turn back with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis. Genesis 49. When the Bible talks about the firstborn, notice the characteristics of those who are the firstborn. Because it's the firstborn of death that devours the strength of the foolish virgins. The Bible says in Genesis 49, Genesis 49 and we'll begin in verse 3 Genesis 49 and verse 3 and when you're there 
Amen. Genesis 49 and verse 3. Bible says, Reuben, thou art my what? My firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. Now that word beginning means the chiefest parts or the, the, the chosen part of my strength. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Reuben, the firstborn, the Bible shows, uses the principle of the firstborn in Reuben is that it's his might, the beginning or choice part of strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. Who is the chosen of Satan? Who is the might of of his power. Who was the one that represents his power and character like no other power could? The papacy. And notice what the papacy is called because remember the firstborn of death is the one that devours the strength. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. What is the papacy called in Revelation chapter 6? Revelation chapter 6. And remember Ephraim representing those who have envy, representing the silly ones. These are the ones that are half-baked, a cake not turned. These are the ones who are having their strength sapped by the papal power. We're looking now at the firstborn of death. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 7, when you're there, let me hear an amen. And when he hath opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And we understand the fourth seal goes along with the fourth church of Thyatira. And we understand that Thyatira was symbolized by that whore Jezebel, which is a symbol of the papacy. But notice what it says here. He's opened the fourth seal. The fourth beast now says, come and see. And I looked and behold, what kind of horse? A pale horse. And his name that sat on him was what? Death and hell followed with him. Who was this a symbol of? This is the papacy. And his name is death. He's the firstborn of death. The firstborn of Satan. His might. The excellency of his power. This is that gigantic system of false religion. This is his mightiest, mightiest efforts to sit himself upon the throne of the earth to rule the world according to his will. This is the papacy. This is the papal power. Now in your Bible turn back to the book of James. Turn back to the book of James. James chapter 3. James, the third chapter. I want to remind us by way of looking at the scripture of what we're studying about this morning. James chapter 3. And we're going to begin again in verse 13. James chapter 3. And verse 13. The Bible says, Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if he have bitter envying, and who are the ones that have bitter envying? The Bible showed that these were, these were the silly. Those who are silly. We saw that in the book of Job, chapter 5 and verse 2. Those that have envy are silly. And those that have wrath and strife are foolish men. So the Bible says in verse 14, but if you have bitter envying, if you're silly, and remember the silly are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The silly are those that are half-baked, a cake not turned, a symbol of the foolish virgins of Laodicea. The Bible says if you have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts or the representation of the foolish men, the foolish virgins, it says glory not and lie not against the truth. Do the foolish virgins, brethren, have where of any, any aspects in their life to glory? Can they glory in the truth? No, they're not. No, they can't. But we're going to see later on in our presentation that there are many foolish virgins who glory in the truth, who actually, who, who actually preach the truth. Well, the Bible shows that they're foolish virgins. And there's, a, there's some serious symbolism here when it comes to wrath and envy. The Bible wants us to understand when we're looking at the wise in verse 13. We've talked about what the wise understand. We've talked about prophetically the truths they understand. We talked about their character. 
Now the Bible is contrasting the wise with the foolish. And the foolish, we know, don't understand. Amen? The foolish are the wicked that don't understand. So we know what they don't understand. We know that they're ever learning and unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. But that's not what James is focusing on. James is focusing on characteristics. Character. Brethren, if there is any envy in our hearts, any jealousies, any evil surmisings, if there's any wrath, any strife, any anger, any malice in our hearts, the Bible shows we are represented as the foolish virgins. And there is nowhere in the word of God where we can now glory in the truth. The wise are not just represented by what they know. They're represented by character. So so are the foolish virgins. We want to make sure that it's just what we understand instead of how we live. Because it might be a lot easier to understand than to live the truth. But God says we need both. God says we need both. We need both the mare and the child's own vision. And it was asked a question last night, which one would be the most important? And maybe it's, uh, well, I, I, should, I wouldn't say maybe. It's not up to us to say what's more important. But one thing we do know, there is no way we can have the experience. There is no way we can know the hope of his calling and the power of his mighty strength and his glorious inheritance in the saints unless our eyes are what? Enlightened. So unless our eyes are enlightened, we can't have the experience. Unless we see the child's own, we can't have the Mare vision. Both are necessary, but we can't focus on one. The Bible focuses on a complete picture. And so I want to deal with characteristics. I want to deal with character. Now turn back in your Bible to the book of Hosea as we start uh, winding this down. Hosea chapter 7. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Hosea chapter 7. We're going back to Ephraim just for a moment. Hosea chapter 7. Let's begin again in verse 8. Hosea chapter 7. Beginning again at verse 8. Ephraim was a symbol of the silly. Those that have envy. We saw in Isaiah chapter 11 that Ephraim is the one that had envy. The Bible says in, in, in uh, Hosea 7 and verse 8. Ephraim. He hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yet gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. The pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek for him for all this. Ephraim also was like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Now, Pastor Taylor, yesterday, took us to Hosea chapter 9 and the third verse. Just flip over since we're in Hosea, just to bring this to your remembrance. Just to bring these things to your thoughts because Ephraim, the Bible says, he goes after Egypt and Assyria. And what is it that he goes to Egypt and Assyria for? The Bible says in Hosea 9 and verse 3, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat what? Unclean things in Assyria. So that which Pastor Taylor has been dealing with about the eating of the unclean things and the walking in the sparks of your own kindling, this is the characteristics of Ephraim. Ephraim is the silly virgins. Ephraim is the silly ones that are ever learning and unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. Bible prophecy, brethren, begins to dovetail. It begins to come all together. It's a complete, it's a complete message. It's a complete work. It doesn't matter what aspect or angle you hit it from. It's all one truth. It's a golden chain. You can't break the links. The Bible tells us, if we go to, uh, go with me back to the book of Job, chapter 5. Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. Notice what your Bible says. Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5 beginning with verse 2 Job chapter 5 beginning with verse 2 and again when you're there amen and father in heaven I just pray dear Lord that you would continue to abide with us father I pray dear Lord that you would uh, remove the uh, demon of of drows and sleep upon your people 
Father, give us a refreshing as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And maybe we can uh, help the Lord out by either cracking a door or a window. It's kind of warm in here today. I don't know if it's the, I don't know if it's just me, but it's, it's very warm. Okay, all right, all right. So we're in Job in the fifth chapter. Job chapter five, and once everybody uh, returns from opening the windows and uh, getting some circulation in here, we'll turn and read Job five. Job the fifth chapter. Beginning with the second verse. All right, maybe just a few would do. We don't have to open all of them. All right, Job chapter five and verse two. Feels a little bit better already, amen? Amen. 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 All right, Job chapter five and verse two. The Bible says, for wrath killeth the foolish man and envy slayeth the silly one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. His children are far from safety and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them whose harvest the hungry eateth up and taketh it even out of the thorns and the what? The robber swalloweth up their substance. The Bible speaking about the foolish and the silly. The Bible says that the robbers will come and swallow up their substance. Well, turn your Bible with me to the book of Ezekiel. Let's find out in scripture who the robbers are a symbol of. Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7. And I've already heard some already saying it there. They're following along. Notice Ezekiel chapter 7. Who are the robbers that come and swallow up the substance of the foolish virgins? The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 21 and 22. Ezekiel what chapter are we going to? Chapter 7 verse 21 and 22. Bible says, and I will give it into the hands of the what? The strangers. Who do we see the strangers were a symbol of? The king of the north. The Bible says, I will give it into the hand of the strangers for a prey and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil and they shall pollute it. What will they pollute or defile? The Bible says, my face will I turn also from them and they shall pollute my what? secret place. When the Bible is talking about God's secret place, what is his secret place? His sanctuary. So the Bible is talking about these strangers and it says that they would pollute his secret place for the what? Robbers shall enter into it and what? Defile it. Now in history, who are the ones, who are the robbers that went into the sanctuary of the Lord and defiled it, polluted it, destroyed it? Well, we know that Nebuchadnezzar did it in Babylon. That's the king of the north. And we know that Rome did it. That's the king of the north. So who are the robbers that are being represented here? Rome, the king of the north. The king of the north. This is Daniel 11, verse 14. The robbers who established the vision, but they would fall. Rome devours. It consumes the substance. It consumes and devours the strength of the foolish virgins. Why? Because the foolish virgins, unbeknown to them, have an affinity or connection. They become the adulterous woman. The Bible tells us back in the book of James, chapter three, back in the book of James, chapter three. Notice what your Bible says. James in the third chapter. James in the third chapter. Bible tells us, James chapter 3, we've looked at verse 13, we've looked at verse 14. We want to look at the rest together and a little bit of time we have at least enter into its understanding and then we'll uh, pick up in our next presentation. But James chapter 3 beginning with the 14th verse when you're there, amen. The Bible says, but if ye have bitter envying, and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Brethren, we've seen the reason why is because those that have bitter envying and strife are the foolish virgins. And the foolish virgins are here denoted as being foolish virgins because of their character, their conversation, their lifestyle, their manner of living, 
their experience. The Bible shows us that we can have a love for the truth. We can have our Bibles. We can go to meetings. Isn't that what the foolish virgins did in the history of the Millerites? The Bible shows that they're virgins because they professed a pure truth, a pure faith. Didn't all the virgins have burning lamps at one point in time? They were all waiting for the bridegroom. They were all joyous and, 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 and enjoying the message of the hour. They knew about the coming of the bridegroom. They had an understanding of certain things. But we're told in the spirit of prophecy that they were, they were content with the flickering light of good emotions. They liked the way that the presenters presented or the way that the things were coming across. But as silly women, they were ever learning. They went to all the schools, but they were never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Not because their minds were incapable. Not because that somehow, some way, God had blessed others and not themselves. It was because internally their experience was corrupt. Envy, strife, the works of the flesh remained in them. James is focusing on this as why they are foolish virgins. The Bible says in verse 15, the Bible says in verse 15 uh, as we bring this to a close, this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and what? every evil work. This is where we're going to pick up in our next presentation. Why is envy and strife represented as being earthly, sensual, and devilish? Why when you have bitter envying and strife, there's confusion and every evil work? This is what we're going to study about in our next installment. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we want to say thank you uh, for your word and for its clarity. We thank you, dear Lord, that uh, you seek to warn us here at the end of the world. For while we're seeking to fill our, our minds with truths, uh, many times we negate the heart work, which is our first work. Father, I pray, dear Lord, that we would have the corresponding experience of increasing in knowledge and also being purified, made white and tried by the third angel. Father, may we be clean vessels, fit for the work of the Lord and the use of the Lord. Guide us and bless us and bring us back together with ready minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.